that BU is a, it's a very large school. Um, so there are lots of different colleges within the university. So arts and sciences, the school of music um, there. And little did I know um, there is a smaller college called the Sargent College of um, Public Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. It was a very long name and I don't remember it completely. Um, but basically that was the college within the university where the public health program sat in. Um, and I just kind of came across it one day during my second year and started taking the intro classes and quickly realized, ooh, this is really great. This is interesting. But at that point, it was a little too late to make it my major. Um, I think I had passed that cutoff deadline, um, but I could still make it my minor. So that's what I did. Um, and so it was my minor for the next couple of years at BU. And then once I graduated in 2013, I knew I wanted to come back to the city. Um, I was just a city girl at heart, I guess. <laughs> um, I was applying to a few different MPH programs um around and landed on Mount Sinai which was just great because I wanted to be back at home um just back back in my old neck of the woods um and yeah I think it was it was definitely an adjustment coming from such a large school like BU coming into a smaller program but it gave me the opportunity to do different things when I wasn't in class um so I thought that was really helpful um, I was, I spent some time shadowing one of the professors, um, during my second year at Mount Sinai. And I actually forgot to mention this in between my first and second year of the program, I did the global health program and I spent two months in the Dominican Republic. And that eventually became my practicum and my thesis. Um, so that experience was amazing. And I highly recommend it to anyone that has an opportunity who wants to apply. Okay, great. And so after you finished um, here at Mount Sinai, how did you decide that a DRPH was the right choice? Oh, so that came a few years later. Um, so once I started at the health department, which is such a big organization and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has about it because there's definitely a lot going on there. Um, I didn't really know that I wanted to pursue the DRPH um, once I left Sinai. Um, I kind of thought I was done at that point with school. <laughs> um, but then when I got to the health department, and it was, it was a couple years in, um, I kind of saw the trajectory of other people and some of their career paths and what roles they would qualify for and would not qualify for um, just based on degrees. Um, and I also realized that if I wanted to do what I wanted to do down the road, which was really lead programs myself and kind of be that program director, I needed another degree. Um, but I really like, I really liked that the health department, um, while there is a lot of research that happens, it's, it's government, it's making policy decisions, it's responding to outbreaks. Um, it's really that real world boots on the ground work. So that I felt was a little bit more in the DRPH world, which is more about leadership and, and management um, versus a PhD, which is a little bit more academia focused. Um, so that's sort of how I settled on the DRPH route. Okay, great. Um, so so obviously between undergrad and your um, your uh, doctoral studies right now, you learned a lot here at Mount Sinai and you used it for a couple of years. So I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about um, what you learned here that, support, that has supported your work um, in the years between starting your doctoral program and sort of graduating. I would def definitely recommend take all the epi classes you can. Um, just epi, it's, it's just, the basics of everything we do at the health department, um, biostats, being able to understand and read those articles and, and understand what all those numbers mean and the p-values and the different tests, all the biostats classes you can take. And I know they're sometimes not that fun, but they really come in handy. Um, and then working with different software 
um, SAS, SPSS. Um, they could be tricky sometimes, but everyone at the health department, those programs, SAS primarily are um, take all the classes you can get. Um, I was using SAS when I was at Mount Sinai and that has really come in handy for me. And obviously you learn so much when you're on the job and there's definitely a lot of on the job training that happens. Um, but just getting that, that those, that foundation that you really, really need just to kind of understand the terms. So even when you're working with someone who's helping you out at work, you at least, you know what they're talking about. Um, so biostats, epi courses, it's really the, just the foundation, I think, of everything that I do today. Wow, awesome. So in working with infectious disease epidemiology, um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you and your career? I can imagine working uh, with the New York City Department of <laughs> Health and Human, um, health, um, um, New York City Department of Health, like a lot changed, right? So um, yeah, can you share a little bit about what that experience has been like for you? Very high highs and very low lows, very low. <laughs> um, it's been a total whirlwind the last two years, um, just from morale and workload. And it's, it, it, it's hard to put into words sometimes now looking back on it. Um, it, it was, <laughs> I, I don't want to say it was organized chaos, but it was a little bit of organized chaos, but there was in the beginning in March, 2020, in those very, very early days, um, there was a camaraderie that I felt that my, my colleagues and I really had at the time we were, we were at the laboratory. I work at the public health laboratory in the division of disease control. Um, so we were at the lab all hours of the night, just running around the building, looking for specimens, checking the specimens as they're on the instruments, trying to figure out, was this one positive? Was it not? Where is it in the testing? Um, just complete, just craziness. Um, but it's, it's been looking back on it now. I think I, I had opportunities during that time that I never would have gotten without COVID in a weird way. Um, I was able to basically scale up all of the lab data at the time, um, kind of just take charge of what needed to be done and kind of field requests from the mayor's office and the deputy commissioner's office and the commissioner's office and just try to rally a team that could help me get all this, all these data requests done. Um, quickly and as accurate as we can, um, because that's what everyone cared about. Everyone wanted to know. Um, I was able to rally that team. We were able to cross train other people and get more people on board, um, come up with a schedule so that we weren't all working at once, um, or that we all weren't working till 11 o'clock at night, every single night, um, come up with a rotation so that we gave each other time off. Um, and this is kind of when the dust settled and we had a little bit of time to regroup. Um, we, we were able to kind of get schedules and plans in place. Um, but it's been, it's been hard. Um, where I've been in my bureau, we've been working in person throughout the entire pandemic. So that's been tough on morale. Um, but we, we just kind of do the best we can and support one another when we can and um, just try to lift each other up. And when someone's out with COVID, you know, we'll cover their work and, and vice versa. Wow, yeah. <clears throat> so there have been a lot of um, changes in public health in the world and work in general um, since the start of the pandemic. And I'm wondering, based on that and what you know and what you're learning, how do you foresee the landscape of public health changing in the next few years? I will say it is amazing that people are starting to really pay attention to public health in a way that I had never really seen before. Um, I think it was, I can't even remember if it was undergrad or at Mount Sinai, but I remember there was a professor 
who once said that public health is sort of the humming that goes on in the background. You don't really know it's there until something bad happens. <laughs> um, so now people actually care. And I remember early on in the pandemic, someone said to me, I learned a new word today. It's called epidemiology. And I'm sure you know all about that. <laughs> um, so people who have no public health background whatsoever are hearing these terms in their their day-to-day -day lives and they're starting to pay attention, which is something that never really happened before. Um, at the health department, we've been, we've gotten, there's been so many grants and just a surplus of money from COVID that's been coming in, which is great. And now we have to figure out what, what projects do we want to do? What research do we want to conduct? How do we use this money in a way that would really help push things forward? Um, and prior to that, it was, you know, can we apply to every single grant we can just to get every dollar? <laughs> um, now we don't really have that problem anymore, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, that sort of changes how um, people, well, I mean, sort of the pandemic has changed how people see public health, like you mentioned, but then also thinking about people sort of going, entering the field and sort of seeing a um, a path forward um, because there really hasn't been as much investment in public health now, but we not, like you said, it's sort of the humming that happens in the background. People understand the value of it. So um, I'm glad to hear that that's been supported by your experience um, um, at work. Um, so from your your standpoint, what should students be current students be focusing on um, in their studies here with, while um, studying public health? I think it's great to get a little bit of everything, um, just to get as much information as you can. Um, like I work primarily in infectious diseases, but I it would be great to learn more about chronic diseases, tobacco control, the opioid epidemic, maternal health, things that I don't focus on every single day necessarily. So while you're still in school, take those classes and try to get that wide variety of knowledge as you can um, while you're still there. Because eventually it, and I have this problem too initially where it's, uh, you just wanna learn everything and, and which is great, but eventually you do sort of have to narrow your focus. And I've had bosses tell me that in the past. <laughs> I know you like everything, but you kind of need to narrow things down a little bit more from there. Um, but I think now it's early enough in your career where you have those opportunities just to kind of get that baseline knowledge um, so that you can narrow it down as you go on. Great. Um, so if you hadn't pursued public health, what do you think you would have done? That's a good question. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure the answer to that actually. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe I would have tried nursing, but I, I, on, honestly, I don't know. Um, you know, maybe I, I went to LaGuardia for vocal music. Maybe I would have gone into to singing, but <laughs> who knows? Probably not. So I, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, don't really have the answer to that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you, you, see, you seem to have chosen public health time and time again, so I can imagine this far down the road. <laughs> you said I don't the really other, Right, the other options don't, are not really coming up. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I guess that sounds like it's it's been a good journey thus far. <laughs> it, it, ha it, it definitely has had its ups and downs, and the downs have been pretty down, but <laughs> it, it's a journey. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we have a question um, from Justine. And just FYI, if any of you have questions, feel free to write them in the chat and I'll read them out. Um, Justine says, thank you for sharing your experience. Um, we really appreciate the work you've done during the pandemic. What are some of the lessons you've taken with you from each role you've had at the DOHMH? Um, I would say be flexible. Um, and you will get asked to wear many hats 
and sometimes it's not part of your day-to-day -day role. Um, but take those opportunities and look at them as learning experiences rather than, oh, this is not my job. Um, there are times when I was asked to work on grants that were not necessarily part of my day job, but someone asked me to work on a grant. And in the end, we ended up getting the grant. And now I can say I have experience writing a grant and whether it was in my regular day job or not, at this point, it doesn't really matter. Um, I was able to get that experience and, and do well and learn from it. Um, so I think be flexible. Um, the health department specifically is one of those organizations where you just kind of have to roll with the punches sometimes. Um, so I would say be flexible. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so the question, um, what advice or tips would you give students for handling the rigors of their program? Time management was really important. Um, and I remember it was, as everyone in New York does, they're commuting and riding the trains and the buses. And, you know, there's so much of your day that's taken up by just commuting. Um, so really trying to carve out time. If you can spend time at the library, go to Sinai early in the day if you can. Um, spend those hours. I remember spending time in the library with a couple of other girls from my program and we just kind of, we would kind of camp out before class at four o'clock um, just to make sure that we were getting things done. And if we had any questions, we could sort of lean on one another. Um, so definitely time management is important. Um, yeah, and I, I think just don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, everyone that I've come across at Sinai um, and even today at work, they're always willing to answer questions. So I don't, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing <laughs> to ask them. Um, so I think definitely just ask questions if you have, um, and people are usually willing to help. Great. Um, so you talked a little bit about the um, work you did in Dominican Republic. What other opportunities did you have during your time here that really supported um, your education and helped you sort of practice the skills that you were learning in the classroom? Um, so my, my time in the Dominican Republic definitely was um, by far one of the, the best experiences I had while I was at Sinai. And I was really, really fortunate to, to do that program and go abroad. I hadn't, I had never, I didn't get a chance to go abroad when I was in undergrad. So I kind of used that as my, oh, I, I got to travel abroad experience. Um, and yeah, and meeting the people down there and working with them every day. Um, it was really, really inspiring and eye opening. And um, it was, it was public health on the ground. It was global health. It was all those things. Um, on the ground, which was great. Um, while I was at Sinai, I was also working with a professor um, in, I can't remember the department, um, but she worked with teenagers um, who, about sex education. Um, so I had the opportunity to work with her for a few months and just kind of shadow her. She was running a program with some girls and I was able to help set some stuff up for the program. and. Um, just develop, get like a schedule of speakers to come and talk to the girls. Um, so that was really helpful in terms of planning and how to coordinate with different people and get things organized and make sure everyone has information ahead of time. And that helped me a lot at the health department, um, all that planning and coordination skills, um, because it helps keep you very organized. And that's obviously very helpful when it comes to your day job. Great, thank you. Um, so you talked a little bit about biostatistics and epidemiology, and I know those courses sort of intimidate students. You know, it can be some of the more challenging courses for um, public health students to work through. But I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about your, like how you succeeded in those courses. I know that they're supporting your work now, but um, what tips maybe do you have? Um, and sort of maybe like just, um, 
contextualizing the importance of having that that knowledge? Ooh, good question. Um, some tips for biostat. Um, <laughs> um, the, they're definitely the harder classes, um, but there's also so many questions online. Um, there's always lots of practice questions that the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it. And you just have to, it just it gets better with time. Um, so lots of, lots of practice questions. Um, and eventually you sort of like get to see the similarities in them. Um, and then when I was trying to code different things, um, just Google, if I didn't know how to code something specifically, um, there's so much out there on the internet that like, like, oh, someone's trying to do exactly what I'm trying to figure out and here's the code. You'd be really surprised as to what's out there and the amount of stuff that's online um, and how many people have the same questions that you do. Um, that was really helpful. Also just, yeah, I think my people in my program were really great with one another. And if we didn't understand something, we, I was always comfortable asking someone for help. Um, so lean on the people in your program too. Great, thank you. So Justine has a question. Um, she asks, could you elaborate on how you translated your APE, um, Applied Practice Experience, into your thesis? Okay, thank you. I was actually gonna ask what that stood for, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at the time, and I don't know if it's still like this today, um, so we had a an advisor for um, each of the different locations. Um, and my advisor at the time was Dr. Hennig. And I, I guess at the time it was expected that the practicum, the global health practicum turned into a thesis um, for the MPH students um, because the global health program, there were first year med students and first year MPH students in it too. For us, for the MPH students, it I don't remember it being necessarily a, a question um, if that would be the thesis. It, it just kind of was, unless that's changed nowadays. Um, but there was, there were certain research questions that the local partner in the Dominican Republic had Want, wanted to learn more about. And this was an organization that Sina had been partnering with for years. So it was pretty well established um, by the time I went down there. And um, they, they kind of knew what they wanted us to focus on. Um, so we had the opportunity, once we knew the topics um, and there were three different research, three different questions. It was myself and two other girls. And there, so there were three different projects that each of us were working on uh, about maternal health. And we each got to kind of pick which one we wanted to do. And we, we knew the projects ahead of time before we went down there. And that was sort of one of the reasons um, that helped you apply to the program. So you kind of knew which location you were applying to based on the topic. Um, and then obviously we kind of um, figured out some more details throughout the process before we left we developed a survey with the local partner um, to ask patients in an urban clinic in Santiago. And we developed those questions with them and they helped translate them into Spanish because this was, this was all done in Spanish. Um, and then once got, we gathered that data in the field, um, I analyzed it back, um, back here in New York once I got home and did the write-up when I got home and that became the thesis. That's amazing. Um, okay, so Lixian asks, um, what is your life work style um, like when you have both work at DOHMH and study for a DRPH? Is it remote learning completely or working remote? Ooh, so this, this is a fun one. <laughs> um, so um, my bureau at the public health lab and disease control, um, we are 100% in person. Um, I, I can't say that's necessarily true for the rest of the health department, um, but we've been in person throughout the pandemic. And the DRPH program at Hopkins, has act, it was actually an online program 
even before COVID. Um, so that was actually one of the reasons why I, I had sort of been eyeballing it for a few years um, because I, I just couldn't really see myself stopping work while I was in school um, or moving down to Baltimore. So an online program was really the only one I felt that would kind of make sense for me and just my, my lifestyle. Um, so, so Hopkins had a, has already had a very good online infrastructure before COVID. So then once COVID happened, it really didn't take much for them to pivot. Um, they have in my specific program there, I have to go down to Baltimore twice a year for a week at a time. And even that is now online because of COVID, but that will probably move back to in-person pretty soon. Um, but the work, it, it's definitely been challenging. Um, once I started school last year, I really cut my day off at five o'clock, um, which was not something I used to do before school. But I kind of told everyone, spoke to my supervisors and just made it known that things are kind of changing for me and it sort of has to be that way. Um, it's the only way I'm going to get through the school. <laughs> um, so it, it's had its ups and downs, but um, I, I, I like the program itself. The classes are amazing. They're so interesting. The professors are great. My cohort is wonderful. Um, and the DRPH program is great because um, it's made up of lots of different people who are, lot, who are in lots of different stages of their careers. Um, there, there's one girl who is in my class right now who worked ahead all of, for all of the assignments because she's getting married this weekend. So <laughs> people are, they're, they're doing lots of different things and people are having babies and kids are going into high school. So it's, it's a wide variety of people, um, which is really great. So we all have different experiences and we can all kind of shed light on certain things. Um, so, so that's been really, really wonderful. Um, but yeah, remote learning, um, it, it's been, I've been really enjoying it so far. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question Alexian asks is, uh, do the MPH courses here transfer to your DP, DRPH study? No, so at least for Hopkins, um, I can't speak to the other schools, but for I think all DRPH programs, um, it, it's a minimum requirement to have an MPH degree. And I don't believe, I'm trying to think. Hopkins, I think, made it very difficult for you to transfer classes over. Um, so I think actually you can, but it's it's not easy. So if you wanted to transfer some courses over like biostats, let's say, um, that the class needed to be taken in the last five years and they needed, they would need to approve the course syllabus and a few other things that I don't remember um, because I had taken the courses over five years ago. So I didn't really bother. Um, so I think in some cases, yes. But another thing with most of the DRPH programs is that they also have a minimum number of years of work experience. So that was another piece. So I couldn't just apply to a DRPH program right after Sinai. Um, I really needed a few years working to get more of that leadership and management experience. Um, and I, I really don't think I would have gotten into Hopkins if it hadn't been for the pandemic. Um, I, I remember I wrote a lot about COVID and my experience, um, my personal statement. So I think that had a lot to do with it. Okay. Um, do you, how do you relate your, I mean, obviously it's public health, right? Like you learned, uh, got a pretty solid foundation of public health here at Sinai. How does that foundation support your doctoral studies? Like, what are the connections you see? Um, well, I, I think it's everything together. I think it's my, 
my studies at Sinai, it's my my work at the health department. I think all those things together have really prepared me for the DRPH program um, because there's so many different people in the program that are that are working in so many different organizations, um, and we all ha- have different specialties and what we're working on. Um, so I think everything together, if even one missing piece. Um, I don't think I would feel as complete or as confident in the program. So I, I think everything together has really just helped me so much. Um, and at Sinai, it's given me that foundation to understand my work. And then at work, it's given me that next step as to what I really want to focus on, um, so I think it's everything together and you really can't do one without the other. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you talked a little bit about the um, how much you're learning from different people in your cohort. And I'm interested if you could talk about sort of what that was like um, when you were doing your master's here. How did your classmates sort of support your education um, and the diversity in your classes um, support the learning experience here for you? Yeah, so um, I'm trying to think. So some of the people in my pro in my cohort, um, my 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 program at Sinai, um, they were in different tracks than I was in. Um, so I was in health promotion and disease prevention, and then some people that I was closer with um, were in the epi track. Um, so while we weren't in all the same classes, there was a little bit of overlap there. Um, and I remember when I. And then we kind of converged when we were taking um, general epi and epi of infectious diseases. Um, and then I remember for those classes, um, there were a lot of group projects, oh, not for epi 101, but for epi of infectious diseases, I think there were more group projects um, and we were paired together and they had more knowledge than I did just because that was their track. And so they were living it and breathing it every day. Um, So they were able to help me really understand certain concepts that I wasn't as familiar with at the time. Um, So that was really helpful. Great. Um, If there was one course you feel like um, taught you what you really needed to know? Like if you were like, okay, I can only take one course in this MPH program, um, what would it be? What would you say um, is the most helpful to you just in terms of how you think about your work? I know we talked about biostatistics and epidemiology, but sort of like the day-to-day um, work that you do, which course supports that most, do you think? If you if you could choose one. I would say epi of infectious diseases and I see that class in every course catalog I see it at the, in the Hopkins catalog and every single time it comes up like I, I think to myself oh I want to take that no you can't take that you've already taken that class you need to do the next one up <laughs> um, but that one it gives such a good breath of so many of the important diseases that are out there still um, and it, it really is just, I think it, it gives such a good basis of understanding, um, so that when I walked into the health department in the division of disease control, um, I kind of knew most of what they were talking about. Um, I wasn't an expert in any of those diseases by any stretch. Um, but I had heard those terms before I'd heard of them. Um, and I can at least say it's familiar and could do some more reading, talk to someone a little bit more about something in particular. It wasn't a totally, it wasn't a complete foreign concept necessarily. Um, so epi of infectious diseases was great. Um, and I think actually it, was taught by someone who works at the health department and I'm not sure if she's still teaching it um Preeti Patella I'm not sure if if she's still there um but she's at the health department now a little bit so um and I realized that years later like wait a minute I 
she was my professor. <laughs> so a little Sinai connection there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Andrea, um, I have a question. Um, you you were talking a, a little bit and referenced the the highs and the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows, right? During your your tenure at 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 your current position, how, mm -hmm. what would you do during those low periods, during the lowest of the lows? Like how, how did you cope with that? What was your mechanism for kind of dealing with all of that? If you could share a little bit about that experience, whether it was in the pandemic, outside of the pandemic, but um, certainly I know it's been a trying couple of years. Yeah. Um, food was a coping mechanism, but other than that, <laughs> Um, other than that, um, I think my, my colleagues, my, who are my, my friends, um, we were all in the same boat, knowing that we were all in the same boat together. So whether that was bringing in a box of donuts to the lab and just kind of like giving one to everyone, um, in my office, um, just little things like that really made a difference. Um, and I have to say, when I was walking out of the building sometimes, and it was seven o'clock, um, and when people used to do the seven o'clock cheer for healthcare workers, that was really, really moving the first time I saw that happen. Um, I remember getting very emotional in the middle of First Avenue and 26th Street, um, knowing that people... Um, people were really grateful um, because it was, it was hard, but I think my, my colleagues and I knowing that we were, we had each other's back. And um, I remember I had a family member that got really sick with COVID in April of 2020. And I was scheduled to work one night and um, I found out that this family member was really sick and I just could not focus after that. Um, so one of my friends said to me, Andrea, don't worry, I'll handle the data tonight, you go home. Um, so we really had each other's back. Um, and I think that's what kind of got us through the dark days. Thank you. Hey, sorry, so we have a, uh, another question um, from Lixian that asks, what kind of jobs or work at DOHMH are there for MPH um, or MS in epidemiology biostatistics degree holders? So many. <laughs> um, data analyst jobs, um, policy jobs, um, to work as a city research scientist um, in that title. And there's different levels within that title, but coming out of a master's program, you, you only qualify for a level one. Um, a minimum requirement for that title is an MPH or an MS degree. Um, but once you have that degree, you can basically go almost anywhere in the health department. So it, the application process is a little bit of a black box sometimes, but with those degrees, you could pretty much qualify for almost anything. Um, so there's a question I have, um, so, you know, you are an alumni coming back to talk to current students and I think that um, there are a lot of different ways that mentorship takes shape. Um, sometimes it can be long term mentor, short term mentor, sort of like this type of experience where you're asking someone questions in a one uh, one time thing. But I'm wondering for you throughout the course of your career, what role did mentorship play for you? Oh, I've, I'm, I've been very fortunate that I've had really, really great mentors. Um, my former boss, um, she was my boss for five years and she was the lab director of the, the public health lab. Um, she just left the health department about a year ago or so. Um, but she basically taught me almost everything I know. Um, and I, I felt like it was someone I could really relate to, um, someone who sort of climbed through the ranks and has, had been at the health department for a long time. Um, mentorship has been so Im important. Um, and I, I think without that, I don't know if I would have learned as much. And 
made is, and even just for making connections, um, that is super, super critical. Um, and I don't know if I, I would have made as many connections um, without this particular person if it hadn't been for her. Um, so just talk to people. Um, and I know that's intimidating sometimes, um, but it's, you never know where it may lead. Um, so mentorship is amazing. And I highly recommend anyone, um, once they feel comfortable, if they want to be a mentor, um, or volunteer to be a mentee. Um, I've been a mentee in the past. Um, I, I've been a men, I was a mentor, I'm sorry. Um, in undergrad, my senior year to freshman students, um, just to kind of help them get acclimated to BU a little bit. Um, and that was really, really rewarding too, because I kind of felt like I kind of know what I'm talking about now. And, you know, here are the things I wish someone had told me when I was a freshman. Um, so just, yeah, talk to people. Um, you never know what you're going to get out of it. Yeah, you make a great point. Um, do you do you remember any maybe faculty or other classmates that had an impact on you during your time here at Sinai? Uh, so, I mean, my group was great and I met my best friend at Mount Sinai who is gonna be a bridesmaid in my wedding this summer. Um, so you really do make lifelong friends in the program. Um, which I, I'm so grateful for. Um, just people were just really wonderful. And I remember um, a couple years ago, I was at a conference in Atlanta um, for the health department and Mount Sinai, the MPH program, um, uh, some people from the program office were there um, who I remember from when I was a student and we had dinner and we hung out at the conference. Um, so you really kind of make those connections, those people that you meet at Sinai really kind of stick around and you'll never know when you see them again, in, in, again, in a professional capacity. Right. Like building that collegial relationship from, from basically from day one, right. And sort of how yep. it transitions, um, throughout your career. It's awesome. Yep. Well, so we're sort of nearing, um, time. I want to open up the floor to any questions you all might have. Um, before we wrap up, you can write them in the chat, if anything. Um, and Congratulations on yeah, your, your upcoming wedding. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm very great. excited. <laughs> yeah. So congratulations, Andrea. I know it's probably a lot going on that you got to plan and work and all of that stuff. I think what I wanted to ask you is how long is your DRPH going to take and have you been able to like set a schedule for it? Um, the when you plan to complete it and all that. Good question. So um, Hopkins gives us nine years to complete the program. Most people do it in four to six years. I'm hoping to do it in four to five. Um, so I was taking two classes per term and they're actually on a quarter system. So it's a little bit different. So I was taking two classes for each term. Um, the last two terms, um, but realized after Christmas that two classes at a time plus full-time job plus just wedding planning um, was too much on my plate. Um, so I downgraded in terms three and four starting in January of 2022 um, to one class per term. And that has given me much, it's more of a balance. Um, I have time to do wedding things that I need to do. Um, I can work um, exercise, which is not something I did because I didn't have any time. Um, but you really have to make time. And by dropping one class each term, that was just the way that it, it worked best for me. Um, and a lot of other people in my cohort could only do one class at a time as well, just because of their schedules. So it's not like I was the only one that had had to drop down a little bit. 
Um, but I do anticipate going back to two classes each term starting in September. And then after my second year, um, I should be done with most courses by then. And then I can just work on the dissertation. So I'm hoping four to five years. Thank you. Um, so uh, in the chat, Lexine asks, oh. application process for DOHMH a black box? <laughs> and I've been on the other side of it where I've been the hiring manager and on the panels. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a little tricky. So when I was applying initially um, for my first job there, um, you don't really hear back. You just apply, apply, apply. Um, and for the longest time, you don't really hear anything. And now I realized when I was on the other side of it as a hiring manager, um, the people that would apply early right after the position was posted were all the way at the bottom. So it's not necessarily the best thing to apply right after the position is posted online. Um, and it does tell you the posting date, so that's helpful. Um, but it, you, there's really no updates. Um, when I was applying, it wouldn't really tell you, oh, so-and-so is reviewing your application now, or your application is moving on. It was just nothing until someone reached out to you. So for a while it was just silence, um, until someone eventually does. So that's why it's a little bit of a black box, but I will say that, um, you really just have to keep trying and it, it, it gets discouraging sometimes, um, but eventually something hits. So you really just have to keep, keep applying um, because people are hiring. There are lots of vacancies. Um, things are moving a little slow in terms of the hiring process, but there are tons of vacancies. So they are looking to fill positions. You see the uh, question asks, are the, these locations in New York City? Yes. So they're, um, so the main health department building is in Long Island City in Queens. Um, and then there are different satellite locations um, around the boroughs. So the health department has different clinics. Um, so depending on what the job is, um, you may be in one of the clinics. Um, um, there's another building downtown at 125 Worth Street. That's another office building. Um, but the vast majority of health department staff are in Long Island City. Great. Okay, so we have uh, like five more minutes. So just last words, any um, advice or words of wisdom that you'd like to share with um, those in the room or anybody who might be watching on the replay? about public health, about your experience, about yeah. you know, how to navigate um, the world of work and or anything else you might find to be helpful. Lean on one another. Um, I've never had an experience where someone wasn't willing to help me or answer a question or yeah, help me out when I was really struggling. Um, so lean on your peers um, and and reciprocate, be that person, um, give back as much knowledge as you can. I think that's the only way we help make each other better if we, we work together with one another. And, and public health is changing so fast. It's changing right before our eyes. So um, just kind of take it all in now um, when you have the opportunity to kind of take as many classes and see and hear different topics. Um, take it all in now when you have the opportunities. Um, because things are changing so quickly. Um, so something you hear now may be different in a few years, but um, just getting that wide breadth and that foundation, um, it'll, it'll really help you down the road. Awesome. Okay, I have one final question. Um, are JHU's courses challenging and demanding? They are, um, but I, I think because I'm a part-time student and I'm also working, that kind of adds another layer of complexity versus if I were doing school full-time, 
I think I would feel a little bit different. Um, but yeah, the courses are challenging, but they're extremely interesting. And every time I've had to email a professor with a question about something, they're always very kind and accommodating. Um, and, and they get it. So it, they're, they're very understanding. So I think it, it's a good environment. Well, thank you so much for your time, Andrea. We really appreciate it. I think you shared a lot of helpful information and inspiration um, about your career journey. Um, and thank you to all who have attended. Um, I think we had a great conversation and I look forward to maintaining a relationship with you um, uh, with the school. Yeah, definitely. And if anyone wants to reach out, if anyone has any questions, um, I'm happy to put my email in the chat um if that's okay with you guys <laughs> sure sure and we can share it as well great great thank you so much everyone andrea thank you thank you thank you thank you for having me all right best good luck, luck with finals everyone <laughs> thanks thanks thank you <laughs> thanks bye